Hi, I'm Andy Acton. And I'm Chris Strevens. This is Dentology, the Business of Dentistry podcast. It's funny, isn't it? When you think about patients, we don't necessarily always think in the context of, of what types of people um, visit dental practices. And then listening to Roy and thinking about kind of the span of anxious patients. Mm. It's quite all-encompassing, isn't it? Well, I hadn't really realised. Uh, it's funny, isn't it? You sort of think of anxious patients as sort of people that are almost like shaking and don't want to be there. But actually, that's probably the vast, vast majority of patients are yeah. anxious. Yeah. So it's at every level. Yeah, uh, and, and even at a, at a, on a sliding scale, um, you, you may not be displaying overt signs of anxiety, but there may be an element of mm. you which is anxious. But I was also fascinated to, to listen to Roy talk about where the anxiety comes from. Yeah, it's not the purpose. not necessarily always driven by a visit to the dental practice. No, it could, could be something be a, else. A non-dental thing that's happening in their world, mm. which then makes that patient anxious. I think it's a great one, actually, about communication. Yes. You know, we, we talk a lot of our podcasts are about you manage to avoid something by being a better communicator. And Roy just sort of summed it up, really. Yeah, yeah. And that thing about it being... A philosophy that has to span the whole practice. <laughs> yeah, not yeah. Just Everyone has to be on the bus. One, one person. Yeah, which is great. Otherwise, it fails. No, really interesting. No, it's good. Very interesting one. Absolutely. If you enjoy the Dentology podcast, you could do two things for us that would be amazing. If you could subscribe, that would be fabulous. But also, if you could give us a review, just tick the box and tell us what you think about it. That'd be great too. Thanks very much for the episode. Here we are, podcast recording. Another lovely day of podcast is, recording with more interesting guests yeah. who are going to blow our socks off with stories. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm looking forward to today. So today we're, we're very fortunate. Uh, we have Dr. Roy Bennett joining us, uh, Roy's dentist, course director at Meadow Dental, an IV sedation accredited training company, uh, and also a lecturer. Welcome, Roy. How are you yeah, doing? Yeah, interesting. Uh, I'm great, guys. Thanks for inviting me. No, not oh. at all. We're looking forward to the conversation. Yeah. We um, haven't had a sedationist before, have we? We haven't. We no, haven't. No. Yeah. Yeah, so you are you're, our first you're sedationist. First. Yeah. Look at that. Well, I'm, not got... just a, I'm not just a sedationist. I'm a hypnotist oh. as well. Oh, are you? So, oh, we've had a hypnotist. Oh, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah, so we know Sharon. She's a yes. friend. Yeah. yeah, Sharon's a good friend of mine. And I learned from Sharon, actually, over the years. So oh, okay. when I do my teaching, we, do, we talk about that. And oh, then wow. we, we put a slide up and we say, how many milligrams of drug do you think I've given this patient? And they all go, oh, about five or ten. <laughs> and they go, Zero. <laughs> I've just it is fascinating, isn't it? When, when I mean, we've had Sharon on twice now, I think. Yeah. She's, it is fascinating. And I just hope then, Roy, that you're not going to put us to sleep. Well, <laughs> you well, must have heard that joke so many times. So many times. <laughs> I mean, just, I mean, we'll get into the, 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 yeah. the bones of the conversation a bit. But, but on that particular point, where you've got mm. hypnosis and, and sedation, yeah. is, it, is it as much to do with the the mindset of the patient as to yeah, whether yeah, they're definitely. more receptive to hypnosis and if not, then they kind of, sedation's more appropriate. How, how do you kind of delineate between which? So, it's as simple as that. Yeah, so so when you meet somebody, you, you have to obviously gain rapport with them and mm. chat to them and work out what kind of personality they are. Yeah. So basically you're trying to tailor the treatment plan to them as everything in dentistry. If you want to be mm. successful, yeah, yeah. you need to, yeah. whether it's implants or whatever, you've got to tailor that psychological plan for the patient so you've got to really listen quite carefully to what the patient's expectations are mm-hmm. and what their requests are and then decide which route we're going to go down now some people don't want to be pharmacologically sedated mm-hmm. they right. just want to feel relaxed mm. so we'll just talk to them and give them some nice imagery and put some music on and etc and, and that's sort of sharon's approach you know with the yep. with the hypnotherapy but I also combine the hypnotherapy with the pharmacological aspect, which means I use less drugs then, you see. So that's just it's just tailoring and listening carefully to what the oh, patient... so there's actually have. a hybrid then. There's at one end just using the hypnosis. At the yeah. other end, there's, there's purely pharmacology with sedation. Yeah. But there's actually a mid-ground as well where you can a relax bit of people both. With, with, with less drugs. Yeah, because oh, what, mm. yeah, cause the Greeks called it <clears throat> the Greeks called it hypnos, which means, you know, relaxation. So mm. the uh, drug companies came along and used hypnoval as right. a benzodiazepine, you see. Mm. Well, so okay. that drug opens up the mind and then makes um, people more 
sort of open-minded about suggestion. Right. Okay. So, so is that a truth so, drug? Yeah, well, so, so a, little, a, little, a little bit like that. <laughs> so we're back to, I expect you to die, Mr Bond. <laughs> <laughs> after, after you paid the bill. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. So now yeah, we're all in a, in a very relaxed state, yeah, which mellow. is a good place to start. <laughs> I, see where, I see where the mellow comes from. So now we can move on to the, the you as being our specialist mm-hmm. subject. So you, um, you've been in practice for... 36 years which is which is some stretch and you say you still love it before we get into the dental side can you just give us a sense of you know your upbringing your childhood your background how did it all start for for Roy? okay so um background brought up uh you know working class background liverpool um my father and this is how i really got into dentistry was a dental technician ah, ah okay so he um, sort of introduced me to the world of dentistry, if you like, and I actually worked with him when I was in my teenage years in, the, oh. in his lab. So I sort of got used to being around teeth, as it were, in that, in that sense. And then I was lucky enough, really, for my dentist to be a great communicator, a really nice, oh. really nice chap, really empathetic type of person. And I thought, wow, you know, he really does change people's lives, this guy. And I just found the whole thing just sort of self-sufficient. I thought running a business sounds good. Running, you know, having a great team with you. Yeah, he always had a great team. He was a great leader. And it was somebody just for me to aspire to when I was about 18, I think. So wow. it was really motivating that this guy was. And so that's what, that was my introduction into sort of dentistry. I almost diverted into pharmacology. Right. I decided to pull away from that. And then I thought... Because obviously I liked, I was interested about all the all the things that drugs do and, and medicines and everything. But I thought I could combine the two in dentistry. You see, mm. I'm just um... laughing. He's got an interest in drugs. <laughs> just made, it, it, as a teenager, just made me giggle. Sorry, right? <laughs> but, very, <laughs> but, yeah. but very intuitive of as an 18 year old to tap into your dentist, good communication skills, mm-hmm. the importance of communication. And yeah. seeing that as something that, that you'd like to do w- with patients in a clinical setting, I don't. That that seems quite an advanced thinking for an eighteen-year-old yeah. to tap into that as being an important part of of the career of dentistry. Yeah, and and people people say that you know you can be a born a born communicator or a good mm. with people. Now, there's a little bit of that, but I think you can learn so much more, and that's mm. probably at university where that was lacking a little bit. Mm. Where I think. I think the undergraduates really do need like a, a really quite a module on psychology. It must make you a good dentist communicator because you, especially with your lab, just thinking that you know yeah. from the point of the lab of how much hassle a bad impression is. Oh, absolutely. Or what, you know, do you know what I mean? So therefore you must have been mm. able to effectively almost reverse that and say, look, I know that if we provide rubbish, <laughs> then yeah. we're going to get poor, poor uh, crowns or whatever because it's our fault. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, you see that word fault. So my father sat me down when I was sort of 18. He said, before you go to dental school, sit in the lab, in the Crown and Bridge lab for a day and watch all the stuff come in. And they'll explain to you what's good and what's not so good. That's brilliant. And, and basically he would say, you know, this lab will do this and how they communicate with the clinicians. And all the clinicians that came in and blamed the technician. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That relation, you know, was soured quite quickly so i always held my technician in you know in quite high esteem mm. <laughs> because it's teamwork isn't it at the end of the day yeah definitely yeah yeah it's that whole mindset thing about it's, it's, it's not yeah. my fault but it's my responsibility well, it's like yeah. we used to, so frank taylor when we bought the business from frank frank um used to do a lot of courses for dentists and he used to say you you're telling patients that this you know this crown is an intricate piece of work and it's a you know it's a piece of jewelry and it's made specifically for you and then he said he used to say and you took such a bad impression <laughs> that when it comes back from the lab you're then having to cut chunks out of it with your drill to make it fit and he used to say if you spend your time getting the impression right and dealing with your lab then you'll end up with a superb tooth that will fit and and that's i think was missed and i think it's brilliant the fact that you were able to have that foot in both sides of the camp really yeah and and you can't be a great working relationship with you with your with your clinicians and your 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 technicians and your team Mm. it it really does fall apart quite quickly otherwise Mm. 
You, you, you touched on um, dental school then, Roy, saying yeah. how it would be great if um, the young undergraduates had a session on communication and, and that was kind of core to, to what yeah. they do. Um, what was your dental school experience like? Because it was, it was a couple of years ago now, wasn't it? And yeah. It would just be interesting <laughs> to get a sense of what, what your experience was like and how prepared you felt to be a dentist when you came out of dental school? Because we've got quite a few young dentists that listen to yeah. this. Yeah, the dental school. <laughs> it was quite brutal. Where did you go, Roy? Uh, Liverpool. Oh, you went to Liverpool? Yeah, I went to... It was, it was quite brutal in a way, but I quite enjoyed it because mm. I was quite... Um, sort of driven to not fail, sort of failed my A-levels first time, retook, and then I thought, I'm never going to, you know, fail again. So I was quite motivated that way. Uh, but it was a bit like uh, being in the armed forces a bit, I guess. Wow. All because right. my experience is I used to be in the sort of TA equivalent of the Royal Navy. So I did that for five years, and I quite liked the structure, quite liked the way that the clinicians pushed you mm. but now it's quite softer in the approach i think and i think we were a lot of our colleagues that i speak to of those days say that we were built for the trenches in a way and that's mm. quite a statement isn't it so i think mm. our resilience was quite strong mm. our internal sort of clocks if you like were strong and uh, when we came across adversity we sort of we could cope with that mm. i think maybe th sorry bro, i was gonna say it suddenly made me think about do you remember that, that tv show life on mars where we went back into the 70s mm. and then yeah. ashes to ashes where it was yeah. the 80s and i was thinking it suddenly made me think i hadn't really thought about it before but the attitudes of your lecturers were yeah. probably supremely different than they are now Oh, absolutely. And, um, but, you know, we, we did respect them and, um, you know, you learn what you learn. So I was quite happy in that environment. I, I was quite like the structure. Not everybody did, but I think looking back now, I think it made us pretty good clinicians, to be honest. Do you, do you think Sorry. better or worse than now? Um, I think there's a happy medium. I think there's a happy medium, I guess. Right. Um, and our exposure to clinical environment was quite, quite, ex quite extensive. Right. Uh, obviously, compared to the undergraduates that come out now, it's it's more risk averse, it's more mm. avoidance, it's more. Yeah. Um, and obviously, there's a there's that caveat of the GDC, isn't there? And and the mm. concerns out there, which we didn't have then. Because did the you do? I spoke to a dentist who was um, significantly older than you. And, I mean, he's been, I think he's owned his practice for nearly 50 years. And, and it's an interesting one. He said to me, when they qualified, they basically took them to different parts of the hospital so mm -hmm. as that you would see different, not, not just dentistry. Did they do that with you? Or Yeah, we, we got, we got, we got a exposure to, like, weekends at the local hospital mm -hmm. and being on call with the medics and seeing various things. I thought, I thought it was quite good, actually. Yeah. Because they don't, I don't think they do that now, do they? I don't, I don't honestly know. I'm not aware of that, no. But he was saying it gave him a great education and an appreciation yeah. of the yeah. other parts of yeah. of medicine, not just yeah. your mouth. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, no, exactly. A holistic sort of mm. approach, yeah. So although it was tough, inverted commas, I, I felt we came out, I felt I came out a better person for it. And therefore, when I stumbled, as, as mm. we all do, yeah. you could pick yourself off and, and carry on again. And I think the important thing was to speak to your colleagues and we'd meet up, you know, years after on um, the old Section 63 things. And oh. as, long, as, long, <laughs> as long as you talked about your failures, that was the main thing. Yeah, yeah, rather and than hiding that, them. And that's yeah. something that I think generally um, dentistry and, and the medical profession isn't particularly good at. I think most people. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I, I, think, I think it got captured really well by Matthew Side in the book Black Box Thinking when he yeah. talked about the yeah. um, aircraft industry where if they have a failure, it gets shared across the whole mm. industry immediately. Yeah. And there's and no I, claim. I, and, and I think dentistry is particularly poor at people yeah. talking about when things go wrong. And, yeah. I, and it's a real shame because, you know, there's a phrase, isn't there, learn from your mistakes, but you can also learn from other people's mistakes mm. as well. And, Absolutely. And that tends not to happen so much. And, and I, was, I was teaching in Birmingham yesterday and, and I said to the group, you know, you know, I'm going to share some stories with you about all my failures mm. because that's where we're going to learn the most, actually. Mm. 
So, you know, I'm putting myself up there and saying, you know, please learn from me mm, of what yeah. I've done over the last 36 years. And because everybody goes through it. And, and I think it's, and, and it's I very, think the thing is, when, you, when you've got the experience and the confidence like you do, mm. it, it's easier to say because you've had success. Yeah. It's, it's quite often it's the younger people in their sure. early stage of their career. Something doesn't go well. They think, geez, I'm an idiot. I, I yeah, think and, and, and those, it's a shame. Yeah, what those people need, and I was lucky enough to have this, as, as we all do it in life, it was a really good mentor. Mm -hmm. So you just need one or two people in your life that yeah. you can discuss things um, privately with and say, you know, am I, am I off the wavelength here? What's going on? What's going wrong? <laughs> yeah. Am, am I doing this right in my career? So yeah. I, was, I was lucky enough that I had a couple of people like that, um, which I'll be always grateful for, you know. Yeah. Mm. Very valuable. Do you still have school reunions with your, your mates um, in school? Yeah, we, we tend to have like a 10-year reunion one, which is, which is quite oh, nice. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So we, we do we do all we do all keep in touch and we all sort of ski together about ten of us which is quite nice as well. Oh, wow. oh nice! Oh, that's yeah. really cool, isn't it? I've yeah. only ever had one school reunion. I think it was like after we'd left about five years, and loads of people went back just to be nosy oh. to, to <laughs> see, you know to see how, how much weight people had put on, whether what? they still had their hair, and what <laughs> jobs they were doing, and then it never happened again. That was it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the best advice after I, uh, I finished dental school on the last day and the professor said to me, I said, I said, Prof, can you just give me some decent advice before I set out into the big white world? He said, never work a Friday. Oh, wow. Good advice. <laughs> wow. You uh, heard it here. You heard it here, chaps, on Dentology <laughs> Podcast. <laughs> Stop working Fridays, for goodness sake. Yeah. Good advice. Roy, can I ask you a question? You know, you were um, you said you did the, the Royal Navy Reserve or whatever yeah, that yeah. was. Did yeah. you were you ever tempted to go into dentistry in the Royal Navy or? That's where, was... that's where I was. I was a dental officer in the R and R. Ah, yeah. right. But you never thought about then turning it into a career as such. You no, know, and um, it's something that I could have done. And some of my colleagues mm. did do that. They did what in those days what was called short career commissions of five years. Oh yeah, or yeah I remember that short term commissions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd highly, you know, I highly recommend that. It's it's a great platform for a young, you know, graduate to start in, in, in a sort of a protected environment as well. Did you um, get to travel? Yeah, I do all that. And it, it's not as intense in your first years in, in practice. So mm. I think it, I, I sort of combined it with practice at the same time, right. so, you know, weekends away and stuff, but really enjoyed it, yeah. Yeah. And then back in 1995, which is 29 years ago, yeah. you did something quite remarkable. Um, you quit the NHS and you became yeah. a private. And lots of people listening to this today will think like, well, yeah, sure, what's the big deal? Okay. <laughs> but, but back when you did it, um, yeah, there bonkers. weren't that many pure <laughs> private dentists and pure private practices. So what, yeah. was your, what was your reasoning and decision-making to do that sort of nearly 30 years ago? Self-preservation. Even back then. <laughs> Even back then. So, yeah, to be honest, uh, insight into my brain, which was, uh, I'm not going to stick this out. So if I carry on in a regimentated sort of closed-end system, even then, mm. and that was mm. item of service, which some people... Item of service, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah so mm. people look back at some of that as a golden period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The more you do, the more you paid. <laughs> yeah, but, well, exactly. But it wasn't that kind of game for me. It was. It was having sort of uh, meeting patients, you know, doing the best for them, not being restricted by prior approval, mm -hmm. um, sort of giving the patients the time they needed. And they didn't have that time in the system that we had. So it was either I wasn't going to last and burn out, which mm -hmm. I could, you know, I'd be on that treadmill, as people call it. But it was a psychological thing for me, I think. it was. I just didn't have the time with the patients mm -hmm. and with them. Mm -hmm. And there's no funding for that. Mm. I, 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 so, I'm intrigued. Was was there a conflict for you in, in the sense that you talked about how much you enjoyed um, the regimented process of dental school? Obviously, there's a regimented yeah. structure that goes through the Royal Navy, yeah. and there is a regimented structure that goes through the NHS. So when you left, notwithstanding all you said about not having the time, was it? Did it feel quite an exposure to leave the NHS and then suddenly not have this? regimented structure that you needed to work to that you were now in control of, of how you determine your future no because b before i sort of jump ship if you like i met various inspiring people 
mm. from across uh, from across the uh, water in America, and they'd come over to speak as in probably about eighty nine, ninety, um, and I'd listen to these guys, and they'd just set up practices with like three hygienists in America, mm. and were making successful living. So I just sort of followed that path, really. Wow. I thought, if they can do it, I, I can do it. Did you? Are you married? Yes. How Still. was your wife when you said that? <laughs> uh, well, um, to be honest, she wanted me in one piece, so, you know. Oh, it, okay, so emotionally she, she thought. She, she yeah. could see the stress that's involved in, in you know, running a, uh, a business that is dictated to by, you know, third-party yeah. businesses. Someone else, yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's quite remarkable that you you identified this 29 years ago and make yeah. those changes. Um, yeah. To have that foresight to preserve yourself, which I'm sure um, has a massive impact on the fact that you still are so energetic and still enjoying what you, you're doing yeah. so many years later. Yeah. I do wonder whether there's other people listening to this mm. who uh, feel they're shackled to the NHS in, yeah. in some way or other. And yeah. you're showing that there's a path you can do it another way. And you did it back at a time when it when it wasn't as easy to deliver. It wasn't, yeah, yeah, not at all. No. But don't forget, you know, in London and Manchester and Liverpool, there were still private practitioners in the '60s. Yeah. And in fact, one of my patients was one of those guys, and uh, he we used to work in Rodney Street in Liverpool, and was um, he knew that he was setting himself aside. Uh, but it's the way he worked, and and I felt a similar thing. So I think it's actually it's a bit of an easier route for people now than it was then. Mm. Um, it's, more, it's more sort of a, accepted in public, not because of the politics, just because mm. it's you can actually go and set up a squat practice now mm. and open the doors, and not have an NHS contract, and survive. Well, it's, it's, it reminds me. I know we were speaking before, but I remember when I think I was involved in dentistry, which was in mid eighties, and then we had the the new old new contract in 90 then the fee cut in 92 and i remember people were embarrassed to say they were private weren't they so they did this i'm independent of the health service yeah. i remember that was the phrasing that people used to say because they they didn't like the stigma that went with being a private dentist mm. yeah and and i i did take political you know flack from patients and everything you did. but you just it's either me or it's going to work or it's not going to mm. work that's what mm. i sort of saw quite early on i could never work in a mixed practice because i couldn't justify to myself the different levels of care mm. and i fully really understand why a lot of people do that because the business model um and you know it's to to have your foot in both camps is is a is, is quite business savvy and i get that but just personally for me it didn't work and mm. I just felt it was a clean, a clean break for me. Mm. Right, yeah. That's yeah. a ballsy move, though. I mean, in because well, what was it, ninety five, wasn't it? I yeah. think ninety five. Yeah. So, well, yeah, ballsy started, move. I started privately about eighty nine, but but I committed to my full list in ninety five. But I was um, lucky enough to work with some principals who could see that I was quite dedicated and looking after the patients. And they sort of let me do that gradually, and then I joined another practice, which was which was fully private. Um, so, and the other thing that I would say is that uh, the psychology of treating anxious patients and setting the NHS aside—that's the reason I sort of sort of went down the path of hypnosis mm. and mm. Um, sedation and anxiety, sort of because I needed those tools to try and. I sort of look after myself and my team because my, my <laughs> team was getting burnt out by all these anxious people coming in, and mm. we were and then we were attracting more and more anxious people, and more phobic <laughs> people. So it became a successful sedation practice. You know? mm. Yeah, but, but, but you, you you started the the sedation kind of the training side of things mm. back in twenty ten. Yeah, but then about fourteen years ago, you got mm. involved in the. Um, the special care side of dentistry through through hospitals. Yeah. What, what, what was there a link between between those activities? Did they kind of all come together at some time? Yeah. So so my my mentor that invited me back into the hospital as a um, undergraduate and postgraduate teacher, because I've done done about fifteen years in practice, and then I thought I just I want something that's slightly different in the week. Mm -hmm. I'd spend my Wednesdays in uh, special care dentistry in uh, Liverpool. And got to be involved with some great people, got to be involved with with cases that you would never do in practice. 
And so obviously mm. that gave me a broad spectrum mm. to sort of uh, paint that picture, that palette, if mm. you like, of all that experience and then transfer that into experience and then teaching outside. So I'd teach at the hospital and I'd teach practitioners outside. And then I felt I could set the company up and, and do that from experience then. Mm. It's quite interesting listening to you talk. You've got a very mellow, relaxed voice. Don't you think so? <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 it's obviously part of – it's interesting because in my head I'm thinking, was that Roy – has that always been Roy? So therefore the extension of Roy yeah. makes yeah. an obvious one going into hypnosis, sedation, relaxing. Yeah. Or have you morphed by doing it for so long that you've become yeah. that relaxing person? It's, it's, yeah. uh, just yeah. listening to your voice. If anyone, you know, you guys listen to it, you'll, you'll get what I mean in the fact yeah. of you yeah. could probably do the Matthew McConaughey Regent <laughs> book story or something and put people yeah. to sleep. And I don't mean that rudely, but make yeah. them relax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, because I'm trying to relax people and mm. uh, you know avoid conflict in the clinical area and sort of make them comfortable. And I think I think that language of hypnosis and all that sedation just makes the patient feel so much better, and it makes the day go better for your team and the session and everything. You know, so that that was a natural fit for me. Yeah, yeah okay, it sounds it. Yeah. What you so like to? Did you? What you like to argue with, or are you just like one of those really irritating people who just like so <laughs> calm and measured? But it's like, oh, forget it, say, Roy, get cross. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'd make a good politician. <laughs> <laughs> when, when we talk about sedation, boy, people immediately jump to it, it being a, 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 a help to anxious patients. Yeah. But lots of the things you talked about in terms of you know making people more relaxed. Yeah. Um, this this doesn't necessarily just for anxious patients. I guess every penny patient will benefit from being more relaxed when they're in the chair. So yeah. what's the kind of the sliding scale of, of, of where kind of sedation fits? I know we touched on this at the beginning. This week's episode is brought to you in partnership with Ultimate Dental Business. We know as guys who have supported dentists for over 25 years and through hosting this podcast that building business skills in dentistry is vital. Time and again, we hear from dentists who tell us that they find the business side of dentistry the most challenging. And we know that stress and pressure comes from doing things we don't feel well equipped to do. That is why we are delighted to be part of Ultimate Dental Business, the new dental business hub delivering top tier business training for dentists. Founded by Dr. Brad Thornton and Dr. Krupal Shah, Ultimate Dental Business is a response to the lack of robust dental business education currently available. Through our effective collective discussions with dentists, it was clear they most needed good structure and effective guidance to give them the knowledge and tools to be successful dental business owners and to create a business that serves them rather than the business that takes all their time and energy to keep going. To find out more about developing your own business education, click on the link in the show notes or go to ultimatedentalbusiness.com. Yeah, so... So evidence-based approach, aren't we? So when, yeah. when somebody comes in, <clears throat> we'll sort of assess the patient and say, you know, what's, what's their triggers? What's their fears? Obviously, 50% of the population around don't enjoy going to the dentist. But we can usually do that with just being nice to the patient and looking after the patient and nice surroundings and everything. The other 50% of that 50%, you'll break it down. Usually about 12% will need some kind of aid, whether it's pharmacological or hypnosis or something like that to get them through the procedure. What we're finding more and more now in current dentistry is longer appointments are quite tiring for patients and they're having several implants in and zygomas and whatever over two or three hours, then that's quite a lot of trauma and that's quite a mm -hmm. lot of, it's a long journey for that patient because they'll be in the practice for several hours. So one of the justifications for sort of putting that forward to the patient is let's make that journey a bit easier for you. Mm. So a lot of my peripatetic work, sort of visiting other practices involved mm. in helping those patients. So not just in my own practice, but in, in practices around the Northwest. Okay. Right. So I'll go in and I'll meet the patient for the first time, get some rapport, guide them through the appointment, and I'll spend the day with the patient while the surgeons mm. do all the work. Oh, oh, that's cool. interesting. And, and is it is it also a, a practice based philosophy as well? Because there's no point in having uh, a highly strung 
um, intense um, patient lounge where the receptionist is a bit you know, on it Absolutely. and then suddenly they walk into your surgery and suddenly it's all mellow. So is, yeah. it, is, it a, is it a philosophy that has to flow through the whole practice for it to truly work for the patient? Yeah, absolutely. Everybody's going to be on the bus. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like everything in uh, team building, isn't it? You know, right from the receptionist, from the first phone call, it's a lot of training behind the scenes mm. of mm. the language that you use. And um, so a lot of, for example, when we get a new sort of um, dental care professional nurse that comes into the team, well, the first thing I'll say to the to the nurse is like, don't ask them if they're okay mm. during the procedure. Don't ask them if they're okay. Mm. Just ask them if they're comfortable or not. Mm. So, subtle difference, yeah. Subtle difference. So language is really, really important. And I'm not sure I'm saying that. Yeah. 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 So absolutely. So you can absolutely say the wrong thing to the wrong to the, to the wrong person at the wrong time. So even when patients are sedated pharmacologically. You know, it's really important that you say the right things at the right mm. time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, like you said, I think controlling that, that whole environment. Mm. So when you do your IV sedation training, and I understand that you know, there's a, there, there is a clinical element to this procedure, yeah. is that focused purely with a clinician or does the wider team come on that training or is there kind of team based training that goes alongside that? So mainly clinical, so it'll be the right. dentists and the nurses, yep. right? But if I if I visit a practice, I'll always start to include the people uh, around that, the receptionists, the practice manager, so right. they get insight into the patient's journey, because right, yeah. it can turn out strangely that sometimes it might be the practice manager or the receptionist that is quite phobic about dentistry. And they, uh-huh. and they pass, they, they, they it pass their fear on. And can actually throw off a negative connotation on phone <laughs> calls. And, and you'd be surprised, wouldn't you? So, yeah. and, and then um, because the way you're brought up and the way you visit the dentist has that impact when you when you get to six or seven, and then mm. it'll stay with you. Mm. And, and we, we pick up on those subtle things, don't we, as well? Absolutely. And uh, so somebody can have a, bit, a little bit of trauma and then they'll just carry it with them, you see. I suppose it's that thing, isn't it? You're going to have an implant and someone goes, (laughs) and that's it, isn't it? You're done. (laughs) Oh, thank you. You sucked your teeth in. So that means obviously it's going to be painful or expensive or both. (laughs) (laughs) But but also I think there's there's a wider context to the importance of this, you know, not necessarily just in a, in an easing the patient, but, good communication skills you know we know and we hear Mm. that the majority of cases that come before the gdc uh, are steeped back in a communication failure of some sort with the patient you know it doesn't mean that things didn't go wrong but it was how it was communicated and dealt with at that time so i guess a lot of what you're doing as well is helping practices and clinicians improve their communication skills which perhaps has the indirect effect that it it means it's a, a less risky business for them to be in in terms of potentially yeah and 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 yeah, and we spend I spend a good hour on my lecture day on that actually, and it's and it's sort of focusing on um, you know what you're saying to the patients and it's mm. sort of setting the scene before they have the treatment and and finding out the expectations and the needs of the patient. Okay, mm. so it's more about sort of no surprises for anybody. Mm. That's, mm. that's the way. We, that's what we're no surprises. It's nuts, really, isn't it? When you think about it, when you think a dentist's job, you know, let's say they work eight hours a day, most of it is they're going to be communi- communicating with a patient and their team, either verbally or non-verbally. Yeah. And there's absolutely no training <laughs> on how to do it. It is mad, isn't it? Have you, have you ever tried to sort of get your, uh, your <coughs> contact in university to bring you in for sort of like sessions during their graduation or I, I, their, I, pit, their learning periods or something. Yeah, to be honest, I think I, I, it would be good, but I think the curriculum is so so um, condensed and, and busy that it, that it is hard for those guys to do that. I think it's on the impetus of the, you know, the, the new postgraduate to seek that kind of information. Mm. And there are various mm. people that you've had on that I've, I've listened to that uh, have gone down that path and have now become sort of communicator trainers for practices. Mm. Yeah. And I can think of one or two people that you've interviewed. And I've listened to those people as well. So I've always had a a hunger or a thirst for more knowledge. Mm. And I think if you can make 
your team happier and you can make the day go easier. Why wouldn't you want to do that? Yeah. And make it. It's just That's quite a simple. Very, very good question. Very good question. Yeah. Okay. And and I, th- and I think sometimes, um, <laughs> I think when you get to a position of being a principal or a leader in your business, I think it, it's sometimes easier for, to have that helicopter view of saying, well, why wouldn't we do this? It's important. And I yeah. think sometimes as, as an associate, as a dentist who, who's a clinician, it, I don't think it's always as easy to see because it's about you as opposed yeah, to about you and your team. So well, I think I, you are I, I sort of, in a wider context. Yeah, I, I sort of, let's put that in context. I sort of disagree with you slightly there because I think any associate can make their immediate environment much, much happier, better with their, with their I, nurse. I agree and, with you. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't mm. think it's always down to the, to the leader or the principal. I think mm. you've got to do this yourself. Yeah. Um, and then you have to think, do I fit into this practice if that's not the mm. case? And mm. then you maybe have to be ballsy if you want to call it that way and then move on to, to the right Somewhere environment. Else, yeah. you. Mm. So you can't change people, but you can change yourself. And yeah. you, you, you can adapt and you can change things about yourself. And if, if you're happier, then that's the right way to go, isn't it? Mm. Out of, sorry, brought, out of interest, after obviously you've been training people for a, 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 period, a long period of time. Have you noticed a difference in the dentists that you train now to you used to train? I think there's a more inherent fear of litigation. Um, mm. because I, get asked, I get asked a lot about that. And you know, and they, they like to understand what's happened with the failures to me or near misses, if you want to call it. Um, and they're quite scribbling down, you know, everything about that. And I, I do feel for them because of all the note taking and and the traps that they feel that they could mm. fall. So, so there is that anxiety, if you like, mm. Mm. in the profession. And I hope that we can resolve that in the future with the higher authorities um, because uh, to me, the pendulum has swung too much the other way now. Yeah. You hope, yeah. don't you? Also, I mean, we see some of the technological advances with, you know, dictation and note, and you sort of hope that I, I sort of think to myself that I'm, I'm, I sort of really positive that I think most dentists want to do a really good job and want to communicate. The problem is sometimes they forget to write their notes and aren't very good at that bit. And that's where they sort of get caught out. And I sort of think if, if they could get themselves just feeling a conversation with someone when they explain something Mm. that was recorded, they might feel better about it than to write a note about it, if that makes sense. Yeah. But you know, all all problems are in the absence of a good conversation, aren't they? As as yeah, yeah, true. have said, haven't they? So, um, and often it's the preamble to the treatment, to mm. the sedation, laying the ground, laying the foundations that sorts those problems out. Because occasionally, my uh, you know my nurse, who's highly trained, will say, "Roy, I don't think you're going to get on with this patient. I don't think they're for you," mm. and I won't. And I won't sort of accept that patient because mm. it has to be that we both get on with each other. Yeah, it's got to be a match. That's interesting. It's got to be a match. Victor- mm. There was a lady called oh, what was her name Victoria Victoria Sampson. Yeah, and she we went went to an event and she um, talked about her GDC issue. And what was fascinating <coughs> was she said she'd just come out of. Uh, you know, graduation FD, and she was super enthusiastic, and that she could deal with everybody. And she said she then realised after that that actually I can't deal with everybody, <laughs> and that's a decision that she had to to realise. And it's it's brilliant to hear you saying, yeah. you know, you're nice saying, well, actually, this isn't going to suit you. <laughs> no, I mean, you, it's, you, you're not a good match. No, it's the old JFK, isn't it? You can't be everything to all people, can you? Mm. So um, usually, it's the eighty twenty rule that. That, uh, that gets bounded around, you know, I probably can look after about 80% of people, 20% yeah. we're not going to match and their expectations, I'm not going to meet those expectations. Mm. Mm. So I'm not abrupt with people. I just say, look, I don't think I'm going to meet your expectations. End yeah, of conversation. Yeah, like, nice way of doing it. But kindly. Yeah. Mm. It, please, it, 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 sorry, go on. You know, please go down the road and try somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be happy somewhere else. In a yeah. calm, measured tone. <laughs> yeah. In but terms of the, these, these, these people, the success builds on success because yeah. the anxious person, the person that's come in and been treated and it's been su- successful, they sort of attract like-minded, okay, they're anxious, 
but they've already had the scene set by mm. the success. Mm. So they come in and they know sort of, oh, I, I don't even look at the website. I just heard about your name, yeah. what you did for my family member. You are the dentist for me. Yeah. And then it I did said, make me... Yeah, go on. It did make me smile when you were saying at the beginning, when you started and you, you had these anxious patients, you then just referred more anxious patients. <laughs> and, and, and then you've got a complete line of anxious patients. I did think, no wonder when you were saying you have to align your team to be yeah. able to deal with that. I could just imagine, yeah. oh, man, we've got another anxious patient. You know, oh, yeah. hello. <laughs> this is obviously what I'm known for. Brilliant. And, and I think early on in your career, uh, this is probably an important thing, you have to find out if that's your kind of makeup. Because you yeah, might, definitely. Yeah. May you not like do doing what I do? So, so yeah. by self selection, you might be better being, you know, a dedicated surgeon <clears> no. with a, with a good team around you who can do all the the comms and the skills and the communication skills. You might get burnt out by doing the stuff that I do. Mm. So, yeah. it has to fit like a bit of a jigsaw. Really. Mm. I think the smart bit though, Roy, was for for me not making sure your teams aligned. Yeah. Because whilst you might enjoy doing that, if you if everyone else yeah. dislikes it, oh, it's then it's going to be a nightmare because you're also going to be in conflict yeah. with them, aren't they? So I think that's a really smart move for people listening is, you know, yeah, find out who you are and what you want to do, but actually you need to get other people yeah. who are who are on your bus, as you say. You know, they're on yeah. they're on the same bus. So the big challenge is when I go and visit a practice for the first time that I walk through the doors and I've never been to before. Mm. And then I've got to win over all the team before I win over the patient. Mm. Yeah. So what I tend to do is have a phone call with the practice manager and say how I operate and what I do, and they think, "Oh, that's great. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna phone the patient up and talk to the patient, you can allay their fears." And I'll go and find out the young, find out all the team members, and say, "Look, this is when I come back next time. This is how we operate." So a bit of time, mm. twenty minutes with a coffee. Speaking to the team is really, really important. Really, yeah, brilliant. We've we've talked a lot about non-clinical aspects of, of yeah. dentistry, and and obviously as a as a clinician and with your team, you you need to do annual CPD. And I I, I sense that lots of people think CPD is clinical professional development and not continuing professional development. Do do you see that dentists and and their teams are more open to doing learning and development, which is non-clinical. A lot of the stuff we've been talking about today, is, is that becoming more commonplace? Um, that's a quite a hard question to answer. I think... It's a good one, though, isn't it? It is a good one. Right? <laughs> you, you've jumped me on that one a little bit. Um, I think people do get set in ruts where they mm. eat the same things, and I think you're absolutely yeah. right. It's important to diversify. And maybe, I think we're all guilty of this a little bit, yeah. including myself, which is going to stuff that you know. Yeah. Okay. So I think absolutely you're right. I think it's really important for people out there to to venture across the border, as it were, and try different things. Absolutely, yeah. Because mm. a yeah. lot of what we've talked about is, you know, your your success – and, and from a business development point of view, you know, we, we laughed and joked about anxious patients, you know, yeah. recommending to, to their friends who might also be anxious. But from a business development point of view, being known for something yeah. because you're good at it is, is, is well, really powerful for generation of new mm. business. Yeah. So the other mentor that I, I can think of in my mind now, um, sort of about 10 years in, I said, I'd had a, a bit of a rough day and I said, you know, oh, I'm getting fed up with this. And he said, just be good at one thing. Mm. Mm. be good at one thing do it to the best of your ability you can't be a general dentist and as we've said please everybody and try and do mm. so many courses endo implants mm. doing everything if you can focus on one area mm. Mm. and be really really knowledgeable and good about it you become sort of happier in yourself i think mm. as well so i had many colleagues that we've worked i've worked with over the years who have like focused on different aspects in dentistry and I've had brilliant careers because of it. it it's interesting isn't it you sort of think I, I'm just sitting here thinking about it and I think one when you look at young people nowadays and this is not some generalization but it sort of is um, and they seem to have a very high levels of anxiety you know that seems to be something mm. that's that's a common theme for you know up to 30 30 year olds that they've got anxiety about 
stuff. But also, I was I was suddenly thinking. You, you mentioned it earlier on. It didn't really twig me. You know, in my head, I think about anxious patients as people like are really like. Whoa. But yeah. actually, probably every patient or virtually every patient is anxious, isn't it? You know, they no one wakes up and says, "Hey, I'm going to the dentist today." Whoop, whoop. There's a there's a an anxiousness on a scale of people who aren't mm. looking forward to someone with a spinny drill thing you might give them a yeah. you know, and then I've got to inject you and all that. I, I, I'm just suddenly thinking that actually, probably most people are anxious patients. It's just where yeah. they fit on that scale. Yeah, and, and when, when we do the teaching, we sort of do, um, rather than put people through dreaded role play, which everybody hates, we, <laughs> we, we put uh, videos up of patient interactions, okay, of people coming in with different types of personalities and saying, this patient isn't anxious about the dentistry. They're anxious because they're, they're in the middle of a divorce or they're moving mm. house or just life events. Mm. So you, you don't know who you've got in the chair, not mm. a terrible word, in the chair. You don't know who you've got in the chair sometimes because they're having a bad day. Mm. I just think people should really think about, you know, more at wherever we are, anxiety is definitely much more prevalent now or may, maybe more noticeable or people are talking mm. about it more. So what you do, you know, in your communication skills is vital. Absolutely. You know, every dentist should be thinking about how I so, make so, it easier. Yeah, and, and when people say, um, so I had, there was a 23-year-old the other day and eyes looking at the floor, wouldn't communicate with me, and she said, uh, you know, uh, and she just said, I hate, I hate, um, I hate you and I hate dentists. <laughs> and, I, and, and, I, and I don't, see a lot of us, a lot well, people get affronted by that, but mm. I don't do mm. that. I just say, so wait for the, eye, the, the eyes to gaze, come up and get some eye contact, and they go, Okay, tell me more. Mm. Yeah. So I've only just met you. <laughs> let's, let's find out about why they're in that position. Mm. Not say to them, "Oh well, you need to go and see somebody else now." So <laughs> it's 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 just asking the right questions, mm. isn't it? And also, I think Brilliant. just being listened to. I yeah, think quite yeah, often definitely. somebody who's got the minute just to say, "Tell me more," and actually just listen. Yeah. It gives it's, them the it's opportunity easy. to speak. You know, and I understand this. And I had it earlier on in my career. It's easier. It's easy to soak up negativity, isn't it? Yeah. And then and then react to that. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. In, in, in an abrupt way, mm, because yeah. it's quite hard as a dentist to think because you, you you've got all this negativity thrown at you, twenty four seven, and then you've got to be positive, haven't you? And you've got to be mm -hmm. affirmatory, and mm. so it it is quite. So you need that skill set of of yeah. good words, good language, good communication. Mm. And just having that that pause between reacting and responding, because when somebody mm, says mm. that, it's easy to react. Yeah, whereas yeah, actually yeah. just taking a breath and responding in a way which is more positive is that the yeah. patient the yeah, yeah. hippocampus or something. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. If, you know, if if and look at if you look at the GPs, right, the medics. Mm. I went to my GP the other day. I actually got an appointment, which was incredible, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I'm sat there, and and all I can see is his back and him on the keyboard. Mm. Mm. So sadly, we seem to be moving away from good communication. Mm. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And, and I think, and you know, as we said with COVID, it was quite tough, wasn't it? Because it was yeah, all right. screen time, you see. Mm. So it's the lost what art. Do you do, what did you, what do you do in a situation like that, Roy, when obviously you're a really good communicator, mm. do you sort of try and bring them down the path of, of communicate, try communicating me like turn around and look at me? It's, it's quite because it must be quite an, an yeah, interesting so I, one for you actually. Yeah. So what I did there was I didn't say anything. I just waited for him because he was asking me questions and he was facing the other way on his keyboard and I didn't reply. So he had to turn turn uh, well, well. <laughs> yeah. around and then go. Uh, did you hear what I said? I said I'm oh, just waiting. To see your face, isn't it? <laughs> nothing like the enforced silence. Excellent, excellent, yeah, good stuff. Yeah, good. Somebody has to fill the void if they're silent. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Are you still here? Oh, you are. <laughs> and not be afraid to do that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Everybody yeah. fills pauses, don't they? Mm. So, There's yeah. another interesting dimension to your your work. It's not current, but it but it was in the past, and it, it would be a good one just to have thirty seconds on. Yeah. Um, you used to work with the police um, on forensic work. Yeah, 
Oh, tell us a little bit about that. Was it was it like being part of CSI? You know, did you come yeah. to oh, dig into the underground? Oh, yeah, what was that? So, with with the sort of trying to get to do different things early on in my career and find out where my modus operandi was exactly. So I went off and did a diploma in um, forensic odontology, right. which is a fancy word for basically talking about how you interpret bite marks hmm. and how you would sadly, oh, right. Right. how you would sadly, you know, um, confirm to the coroner and the courts hmm. that what happened in a death. You see, right. so it would be. Um, if the deceased had bite marks on them or if there was a murder or if there was a, an assault, because often in assaults, people will become animalistic right. and sadly will bite somebody's ear or something and oh, leave right. them. So it wasn't just necessarily it wasn't identifying, it wasn't just identifying the dead no, person, no. it was also the person that had been attacked as well. Yeah, yeah. So oh, we'd wow. end up in court and, and there'd be people sort of, uh, the prosecution and the and the, and the wow. uh, defendants sort of saying, you know, you know, no, I didn't do that. And then I would have to say, well, the model does match mm. to the bite mark. Because we take quite harrowing, That's quite harrowing work, isn't it? Yeah, so I got to meet some really interesting people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Interest, interesting is a key word. Yes, interesting, yes, shall we say, yeah. So uh, so I, I did that for a few years but uh, and got to places I'll probably not get to now. But hmm. the thing is, uh, so it was identification. It was, it was um, um, legal cases of bite marks and things like this. So, but the science, there was a famous Australian case, which was the, I think it was the dingo baby or something like that. Oh, okay. um, there was a bite mark yeah. case that was yeah. that was in the late seventies, yeah. and it was a bit dubious the conviction. Yeah, wasn't it overturned or something because of the bite mark analysis? Yeah. So now everything's become more digital. There's there's probably more evidential um, mm. basis to it, but what I found was when I was cross examined in the dock. It was quite a harrowing procedure because right. I didn't have a legal degree, yeah. and I, you know, I'd already done a lot of study. And I thought, listen, am I at the crossroads? Or I'm not going to have to go and be a barrister, you know, mm. try and defend myself because it was very. These guys were, and and girls were very clever the way they were cross mm. cross examining yeah. you, and and, um, and I guess as an expert uh, witness, they obviously yeah. discredit you. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Mm. So yeah. It, it was something that I felt that I, I didn't really want to continue. And mm. digital was starting to take off then. Right. So I, I felt impressions weren't accurate enough for me for the right, bite yeah. analysis. But it was it was an interesting time. Oh, yeah. I bet. I bet. <laughs> Roy, we've got to the uh, the point in our, our conversation where we need to put two questions your way. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. The first question is, um, you're a fly on the wall. Where are you? Who's there? What's the situation? Okay. I would probably like to be in Apollo, probably Apollo 11 taking off, something like that. Wow. Being in the capsule. Yeah. And, and looking at the build-up and, and watching the guys and everything and just mm. taking it. That'd be brilliant, yeah. I, w I wonder if those, those situations are as intense as we think they would be or whether they're actually incredibly relaxed because of their training. Yeah, they're probably quite controlled in a way. But knowing yeah. what's going to happen would be would be brilliant, yeah. And knowing what's gone before, because you'd think, in you, even though that I can't remember which Apollo it was that sort of burnt the people on the pad or something, but you must have that yeah. sitting somewhere in your mind that you know this is yeah. a dangerous, know, however tall it is, with how many moving parts that yeah. I know it's been tested. Yeah. <laughs> it, <it's>, however, <laughs> yeah. apart from my calm persona, if you like, I do like sort of risk a little bit as well. Oh, so, okay. When the Navy were, were training me, and I'll just be brief on this, but they they won't let you in a helicopter, you see, unless you've done – they ditch you in the water first in a helicopter in training. And it's called, right. the, it's called the dunker, okay? So they, they stick you this thing, they drop you from about 10 feet, roll it, put the, put the pool lights out. And then oh, I've say, seen that. And then say, okay – you're number eight in the queue. You have to wait to get out to the side window. So I really enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> so I quite I quite like that sort of you know that risk uh, that adrenaline, yeah, that adrenaline, yeah. So so do you do anything risky now? Yeah, I do a lot of uh, water skiing, which can be dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've snow skied for thirty years. You know, love that. Wow. So go go out on, on a rib on the on the Menai and. Yeah, I love it. It's great. 
<laughs> so that's your escapism. It's great, isn't mellow. it? You've got this calm, balanced, mellow yeah. chap, yeah. and then he's like, woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, to, just to get out of the clinic, I think, and that's that's yeah. what I say to you know. Give me a that, zip line, and I'm off. <laughs> yeah, don't don't just do 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 dentistry all the time. Go and do some thrill stuff as well. Brilliant. Get out, get out in nature. Yeah. Absolutely. And then our our final question is: If you got the opportunity to meet somebody, who would you like to sit down and have a coffee or a glass of wine with? Living or dead, as we say, yeah. fact or fictional. Uh, this is easy, Napoleon. Oh. oh. Hmm. Okay. okay. Before Waterloo. Right. <laughs> and any reason why Napoleon? Because that was really quick. I've just been reading a lot about him recently. Oh, okay. Obviously the film came out, but I went off and some, got some books on him. Just fascinating guy. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Really interesting. Quite lambasted in history and and as a, as a conqueror, if you like, but there's so much more to him than that. History is uh, written by the victors, isn't it? So. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I really, really, really like, that. Yeah. like to have met him. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, it's been an absolute joy. Yeah, Thank fascinating, you for your time. really it's fascinating. A, it's a, yeah. it's a lovely... so relaxed, don't you? I think it's a lovely point to catch you in your career as well because there's so much wisdom and, and knowledge that spends a, a decent period of time that I think lots of people are going to look at and go, I remember those times. Or there'll be yeah. younger dentists who'll be like, wow. Mm. I have no idea how important these things are. And if they can yeah. catch some of those key messages around communication early oh, on in definitely, their career, yeah. so communication, it puts yeah. them on a, a better trajectory so they can engage with their team and their patients. It's, it's going to be hugely valuable. Okay. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thanks very much. No, no, no really brilliant. Enjoyable. Thank well, you very much. Yourself. really well. interesting. Cheers, Roy. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Dentology, where we discuss the business of dentistry. If you like what you heard, please do subscribe where you found this episode. That would be amazing. And also follow us on Instagram.